Our speaker tonight, who is our curator of collections and exhibitions, Ben Haney. Uh, ben moved here two years ago from Buffalo, New York, where he worked at the Albright Knox Art Gallery. He has a master's in art history from the University of California at Riverside. And uh, he has done a lot of excellent work for us since he's been here. He's worked on some really great exhibitions for us, including, of course, uh, the Eugene Martin exhibition. And I did want to point out that we have these great catalogs. Uh, ben wrote a really nice essay for this catalog, as did um, Suzanne Frederick, who is Eugene Martin's widow, who is here tonight. And I want to just recognize Suzanne. Thank you for driving out from Lafayette to be with us tonight. And uh, the third essay in this catalog is written by Marie Venus, who is a um, exhibitions coordinator at the Louvre Museum in Paris. And it has uh, images of all the work in our collection by Eugene Martin. And they're only $12. And all the proceeds from this go to support the Master Museum. So if you've not bought one yet, please pick up one tonight. And please help me welcome Ben. Martin was an accomplished musician and incorporated his experience of rhythmic improvisation, also associated with modernism, uh, to illustrate the irregular but often cyclical manner in which humans perceive, understand, and experience the world around them. He used biomorphic and quasi-mechanical abstractions to create a link between the physical world, um, but he warped them to reference the slipstream nature of subconscious and consciousness as well. Uh, his improvisational language ascribed to any moment or period relates to his whole body of work. He conceived of it as fluid and let it be guided directly by many variables. Chief among these variables was access to art making materials dictated by his financial means, a passing interest in any given media or subject matter, as well as his mood. <clears throat> Most importantly, he would also muddle the chronology of his art by creating work to add on to old pieces, dismantling a completed artwork, and then incorporating it into several works, or doing the same with photographs of his art. This totally integrated art practice is what makes Martin stand out from other artists. His improvisations permeated his entire decision-making process. If you were alive today, I think you would smile at my inability to convey his story in any manner other than a kind of disjointed, strictly chronological fashion. In the late 2010, um, the, the seeds of this exhibition were planted. Suzanne uh, called the Master Museum, or wrote Evie, and, and said that she was interested in donating work to our permanent collection. Uh, she was interested in making sure her husband's legacy was recognized and was looking for museums to help do that. Um, and Evie passed that information along to me, and I did a little research, and his work seemed like beautiful, gestural abstract work based very much on improvisation, not unlike, you know, many abstract expressionist artists that you, would, whose work you'd recognize. I also saw that he was in the permanent collection of many prominent museums in our region and outside of our region as well. LSU Museum of Art included the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, the Schomburg Center for Black Culture in New York, as well as the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. <clears throat> he had also had a, a very good uh, showing at exhibiting his artwork. He's shown recently at the Oro O'Keefe Museum of Art, the New Orleans African American Museum, LSU, of course, um, and he's been curated by the likes of David Houston, who now works at Crystal Bridges up in Arkansas. I got in touch after some discussion with Evie and my collections and exhibitions committee. We got in touch with Suzanne and we decided that we'd go and take a peek and see if we would in fact be interested in taking a donation. At the time, the curator of uh, education public program, Joshua Chambers, accompanied me. Um, we were floored by the, the volume of work that, that Martin has created. All of it very good. And I enjoyed seeing many works of art that exemplified what I had read about him in advance of the trip. But his collages stood out to me. Here we have a, a photograph from 1988 on the screen. Kind of serves as a, a keystone period when uh, his collage work really became mature. Uh, what I would call, you know, what led to some of his masterworks. 
Um, the way his collages confuse the natural chronological progression of his body of work lend a richness to, to all of his pieces that really, that really spoke to me. Uh, on, the, on this first visit, uh, <coughs> Suzanne and I started talking about how many pieces uh, we may wind up with and what our obligations would be to her. And we decided that uh, we should accept the donation. And if we did, we would have an exhibition of the work and a, a catalog to accompany the exhibition. And then there's one, one small problem. A key part of Martin's work are his titles. And many of his uh, works in our collection are untitled. And that is because he didn't give work titles until right before they were exhibited. He would make them up, and they would not necessarily refer to anything in the imagery, or they might give you a hint of what the imagery might look like or could mean to you as a viewer. And so we have lots of works with titles scratched out, because he eliminated the title after they were taken down. So many of these pieces untitled, if you flip them over and look at them, Please don't do that. <laughs> but, uh, they have titles that have been scratched out. And so the ones that uh, have titles that weren't scratched out do bear a title. And the ones that don't, uh, you know, clearly are, have been marked on the title. And I invite you to invent your own titles for them as you, as you move along. I think that uh, Eugene would have liked that. Mm -hmm. After getting the go ahead to move forward on this project, here's a, a collage work. Uh, from 1991 with pieces incorporated from the 70s. Uh, Evie and I went down to his Lafayette studio a second time, and there we met Marie Venus. Uh, she discovered Eugene Martin uh, working as a research intern at the New Orleans African American Museum. She holds an MA in Museum Studies from the University of uh, Picardy in Amen. Uh, as well as an MA degree in modern and contemporary art history from the University of uh, Paris, Pantheon Sorbonne. Her thesis is focused specifically on Martin, and her advisor is uh, Philippe uh, Dagan, the art critic for Le Monde. Uh, she's currently working on a, as an exhibition coordinator at the Louvre, and as a side project, she's putting together an exhibition that deals with Martin's interactions with uh, former photographer and his former roommate, Marco Leonardi. There's one more thing about uh, how the show came together. Abby and I spent a great deal of time considering the framing for the show. Because we're a small museum, it has to be stored in the frames. And so we wanted each piece to have its own character, but relate to the series. So each work from a specific period of time is going to kind of have the general look of a series, and also the framing will kind of hint to you that it belongs with other work, the similar frame. Now, specifically, in Martin's art is a corollary for his personal history, but it's purely symbolic, and it's not revealed to viewers. Uh, it points towards his deeper metaphysical outlook regarding the nonlinear nature of life, art, and time. And his specific story began in Washington, D.C. in 1938, when he was born. His father was a jazz musician who made a living on the road. And uh, his mother died unexpectedly when he was five, and he bounced around from foster home to foster home because he kept running away. Uh, he did not find any foster home to his liking, and so between his fifth and seventh birthday, he got he got in bad with the law, so to speak, and he was sent to reform school with very serious juvenile offenders who were much older than him. And the physical abuse he faced there gave him a lifelong desire for solitude. It also gave him the ability to freely remove himself from any social obligation that he felt was detrimental. Uh, so it gave him a very independent streak. In the mid-40s, he was successfully placed in foster care with a childless uh, couple, the Snowdens, in Clarksburg, Maryland, on a farm. And he stayed with them for the remainder of his uh, youth. Like his father, he understood and loved music. In Maryland, he was a member of his high school band, as well as the New Tunes, uh, an R&B band that saw limited local success. Um, and it's my contention that Martin's knowledge of music informed how he improvised later in his life as a visual artist.
Uh, there was also a brief stint in the Navy, and that ended amicably. Uh, <laughs> the two of them separated amicably uh, before his requirement was up. They decided that it was a relationship. Was not going and shortly thereafter, from 1960 to 1963, Martin attended the Corcoran School of Art, where he studied painting. <coughs> shortly before enrolling, he decided to forsake a career in music because it would have meant he would need to collaborate with others as part of his creative process. And so I think that was probably a good decision. He worked nights as a janitor and often viewed his privileged classmates who complained about the stresses of life through a gentle but sardonic lens. His experiences in school and interactions with other students unavoidably impacted his perspective, but his loner's experience of the counterculture movement may have had the largest impact on his life as an artist. He generally spoke and thought about life in general terms and was virtually apolitical. But that being said, he was very invested in his own place in society and decided to attend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech shortly after leaving the Corbett School of Art and Design. Even so, Martin did not use his art to provide a great deal of direct commentary or advocate for change during the social and political upheaval of the 1960s. Instead, he internalized much of the progressive sentiment of the time, using it to justify his own artistic and life choices from a place of self-fulfilled authority. This impacted him in two ways. First, his unwillingness to make art explicitly about the black experience alienated him from the type of people who would have championed him during the 1960s. But it also struck him as absurd that a black man pursuing his own singular vision was not considered emblematic of empowerment and integrity. As a result, Martin's sense of life's absurdity, coupled with his pre-existing sense of humor, is undeniably present in much of his art. This particular work, untitled 1967, is indicative of the work when he was attending school, at least in the very beginning. It shows a sense of naturalism, and during that time he was copying old master's work, and he has other, some larger work that's still in existence, it's a little bit more fully developed. But aside from that, he has a great deal of work from the mid to the later 60s that is greatly influenced by modernism and high modernism, as I've already touched on. The likes of Breton and Dali, Picasso, Kandinsky, Clay, as well as Motherwell. Uh, not unrelated to automatism, uh, his work has a sense of uh, free flowing subconsciousness, but it's driven by a very strict and rational, conscious decision-making process. And the, the way in which it interacts with the subconscious freely is in the viewing. His work is formalist in that he's driven to explore the compositional ramifications of choices he makes. If he makes a mark here, he must make another mark somewhere else to balance it out, and that kind of battle is what he's interested in from a compositional <coughs> standpoint. And he would regularly choose compositional battles to have with himself and explore them thoroughly, and then once there, he felt they were exhausted, he would move on. And with the exception of the mid-70s, it's a little bit of a less defined period. You know exactly what time within a range when a work was made simply by looking at it because he was so strict in working with a series for a certain amount of time. And being easily tracked, the bulk of his work has a chronological flow, and this makes it, the impact of his later collage work that purposely jumbles that, it makes it more easily felt. And here we have a piece from the 60s, it's pen and ink on napkin. And what he's done is he's created a grid, very, very strict and a rational grid, and then improvised freely within that structure, kind of challenging himself. And all the shapes are very irregular and gestural. For much of his career, because he never took on a second career, as many artists are forced to, he lived in what you could call picturesque poverty. He frequently worked outdoors because he never had a studio. And so here are some pictures of him in Washington Circle uh, creating work. And this is a piece 
very reminiscent of Picasso's work, you could say, from 1968, with the figure. This, these three works, this triptych, now for the sake of this slide, I had to organize it horizontally, but it's vertically over here in that corner. It's called This is an Easy Three, and it's a, a collage triptych. The date itself is 1969 to 1970 for the three pieces. And the circle series is also an excellent example of the type of compositional restrictions that he placed upon himself. He would draft a circle onto a piece of paper and, and start making marks and explore the ramifications of that. <coughs> And then within this particular series, you start to see whimsical figures and a depiction of space that illustrate a sense of play as well as engagement with surrealism, where pieces start to look as though they are heavily influenced by surrealism. <laughs>